All right, so uh, let's get started. So a brief summary of what we discussed uh, uh, on Monday first. Uh, so we discussed essentially what solid state physics is not. Uh, we discussed the uh, macroscopic extreme, and so we tried to identify where in the macroscopic world we can find evidences of uh, uh, properties that might actually um, be connected to the, uh, to the microscopic scale. But of course, uh, we're not going to focus uh, during our lectures on the macroscopic aspects. We're going to focus on the atomistic aspects, of course. And also, we briefly discussed at the end uh, the, uh, what uh, solid state physics is not on the other side, namely on uh, small uh, sizes and, and time, scale, time scales. We uh, discussed the fact that uh, the nuclear physics is, in principle, not of interest to us, not because it is not relevant, but because uh, uh, the implications of nuclear physics are are, are simple for us, and we can just take the results of nuclear physics and consider ions or nuclei as, a, as an entity without uh, uh, us having to know what, the, what are the details of, of, uh, of, of what takes place inside the nucleus, for example. Okay, so we're going to concentrate on, uh, 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 on a few basic uh, ingredients uh, that we borrow from fundamental physics. Uh, uh, one is quantum mechanics, uh, the other one is electromagnetism. Uh, the basic particles will be uh, the nuclei as a single entity, of course, for us, uh, the electrons, uh, and we'll be using quantum mechanics and classical mechanics to develop our understanding of uh, the properties of, uh, of solids and, and of materials. So let me now briefly, uh, since I promised it last time, uh, uh, give you an outline of, uh, of the course, uh, of the topics that I hope we'll be able to cover during the course. So this is the... Um, <clears throat> the outline of the course. So, of course, there was an introduction, which we uh, already discussed uh, uh, yesterday, uh, on Monday. Uh, but let me begin with uh, well, the first real topic, which we're going to start today. And today we're going to discuss the uh, lattices. And we're also going to uh, uh, discuss in more detail what crystals are. And we are going to, uh, to develop uh, a mathematical theory for that. Now, I understand that many of you might be already familiar with this concept, but it's good to uh, fix the mathematics first because these concepts are going to be useful extensively throughout our classes in the, in the next lectures. Uh, we will also discuss later on the uh, uh, reciprocal lattice. Of course, this is done in connection uh, with X-ray diffraction. In fact, the way we will discuss it is by discussing what X-ray diffraction is first, and then we'll see that X-ray diffraction can be easily understood if one introduces this mathematical concept of the reciprocal lattice, uh, which, of course, is a consequence of uh, the concept of a, of a lattice uh, and, of, and of, the, of a crystal structure. Uh, we will uh, then uh, start discussing uh, uh, more... Uh, we'll, we'll go a bit deeper in the electronic properties of, uh, of solids, and uh, I will have to start with a bit of uh, uh, refreshing concepts in atomic physics. Mm. What kind of um, electrons are important uh, uh, for us? Uh, we'll probably also refresh some concepts of chemistry, uh, the concept of valence electrons, for example. What are valence electrons? Because these are very important for us uh, in, our, in our discussion. And then we are... Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, in some depth uh, the concept of uh, uh, bonds, of chemical bonds. Mm. And here we are, uh, we're going to discuss um, different uh, types of bonds, uh, from the covalent bond to the ionic bond uh, to the weaker bonds to hydrogen bonds. Uh, we're going to spend probably a couple of lectures on that. Uh, of course, uh, uh, what one needs to keep in mind is that there is no real distinction between different types of bonds. It's just, I mean, a qualitative distinction. So we're going to take uh, extreme cases to discuss uh, properties and also uh, mathematical tools and theories that allow us to uh, understand the chemical bonds, but always keeping in mind that the real bond is something that uh, is typically a combination of, uh, of, different, uh, of different effects and different phenomena <coughs> causing atoms to, uh, to, uh, to like each other, to bind, to form, to form bonds. And this is, of course, the basic, um, 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 say, um, subject that allows us to then uh, 
uh, extend our study to, uh, 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 to more complicated systems like solids, extended uh, assemblages of, of atoms, not just uh, pairs of atoms binding uh, uh, to each other. So after we discuss the chemical, the chemical bonds, we're going to uh, um, uh, briefly discuss also the, um, uh, um, the concept of uh, um, bonding energy. And connected to that, uh, we're going to discuss vibrations. So once we understand how atoms bind together and they form the solids, uh, it is very interesting to look at what happens if you perturb these solids, these uh, uh, fixed arrangements of atoms. Uh, and we're going to discuss, therefore, uh, the uh, phenomenon of uh, vibrations, that is small displacements out of the equilibrium position for the atoms. Uh, um, we're going to see it both uh, in terms of uh, vibrations in molecules, in uh, finite systems, but also in terms of uh, 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 collective vibrations of an extended infinite, uh, infinite system uh, in principle. Um, after we are done with this, uh, and this sort of ends the um, more mechanical uh, part of the course, uh, mechanical in the sense that we're looking at more uh, mechanical structural properties of, uh, of solids, uh, we're going to start a discussion about the electronic states. Uh, mm? So we're going to go back to a point three, and, and, uh, and from here, essentially, we're going to start, uh, restart the discussion about uh, the ways electrons arrange themselves in solids. And so we're going to, uh, to start uh, with a discussion of a very interesting model. So now we're going to dis start the discussion of the electronic states. And in particular, the first uh, example that we will uh, make uh, is the tight binding model. It's a very powerful model that allows us to understand a number of interesting uh, properties of, uh, of electronic states uh, in, in uh, solids. And uh, together with that, uh, actually, to the opposite side of the, uh, of the uh, approximations, and we'll come back to these details later on, uh, we are going to consider also the uh, quasi-free electron model. So in one model, in the tight binding model, the assumption is that electrons are still tightly bound to the atoms. So atomic physics is a very good starting point to describe the electronic states uh, in the tight binding model in a solid. Vice versa, the quasi-free electron model is a model where you assume that the starting point uh, is, uh, electrons, is free electrons, slightly perturbed by the presence of an underlying lattice of nuclei. Mm? So they're quite distinct in the way you handle the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, again, the electronic states. Uh, and the results, of course, are also quite different. And of course, they apply to different uh, Solids. Some solids are better described by this approximation. Some other solids are better described by, by this approximation. Connected to that, and in fact, in parallel to this, uh, I'm now referring to this as eight, but in fact, we are going to discuss it, I mean, in parallel with, uh, with our discussion about the electronic states in tight binding and quasi-free electron model, I'd like to say something about more general uh, properties of uh, electronic states. So this is also electronic states, uh, but more general properties. Uh, <clears throat> and, and these general properties are, well, first of all, it's Bloch's theorem. We're going to discuss it in conjunction with this, so it's not really a separate topic. It's something that we're going to discuss in parallel, making going back and forth from the models to the, to the general theory. Uh, Bloch's theorem, and of course, the concept of uh, Brewen's own and finally, band structure. This is probably one of the most uh, powerful concepts in solid state theory. Mathematical theories that allow us to describe electronic states in a very powerful way with a lot of consequences for what concerns the uh, properties of solids. <clears throat> 
electronic properties, of course. And then we move on and uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, some consequences of uh, 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 applications of uh, our theory of electronic states, uh, and there will be a number of them. We're going to discuss a little bit uh, transport, uh, so how electrons move. Uh, I'm, of course, I'm talking about electronic transport. And then we're going to discuss also briefly optical properties. They're all connected to, uh, to the electronic states, of course. Once you know and you understand uh, the details of uh, these uh, theories, then it's quite straightforward to extend them and to uh, uh, apply them to uh, real properties uh, like transport, conductivity, optical properties, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Then at this point, the plan becomes a bit vaguer, and it really depends on uh, where we stand uh, towards the end of the course. Uh, there are a number of topics that we might be able to cover, but I'm not so sure, depending on really uh, where we get by the end of the, um, uh, the course. Uh, uh, some optional topics might include semiconductors, uh, uh, other possibilities to look at magnetism. We'll see. We'll see later on. But I would say this is really the bulk of the course, and then we'll perhaps consider a few additional topics if time allows us. All right. So I'd like to start today with the uh, discussion on uh, lattices and crystals. Mm? Okay, so the first lecture is going to be on lattice. In fact, it's going to take us a bit more than one lecture, I guess. Okay. So first, we have to come back to uh, a discussion we already made uh, um, Monday. That is, uh, we all know, although we're going to uh, detail it uh, a bit further today and also in the next lectures, we know that atoms li like to arrange in a regular fashion, right? Well, we know it because there is experimental evidence for that, uh, and we're going to come back to that uh, in a couple of lectures when we will discuss X-ray diffraction. X-ray diffraction is a very powerful tool to uh, realize and to extract evidence about uh, the uh, ordering of atoms in a, in a solid. But I guess we are already familiar with this aspect, so I don't need to uh, do X-ray diffraction first. Uh, let's, do the direct, let's go directly to the, uh, to the evidence that we have that uh, uh, crystals exist. So there are atoms like to arrange themselves. Of course, uh, they, this, this is supposed to be ordered. It's not because just because I'm uh, not very good at drawing things, but... Uh, you should expect atoms to be arranged in a, in a regular fashion, right? And as we discussed uh, last time, uh, of course, uh, there is no such a thing as an infinite crystals. Mm? We like to think, and we will like to think uh, in, in our theory, that the crystals extend uh, from minus to plus infinity. But of course, we have to consider there are boundaries, there are grains, or even if there are no grains, uh, at some point the crystal reaches a surface, so the surface breaks the uh, translational symmetry, obviously. So we always have to keep in mind that when we discuss lattices, we are going to do it with a theory that assumes that the lattice is an infinite object, but of course we always have to keep in mind that there's no such a thing as an infinite object in nature. Uh, real materials, real solids are always uh, finite, whether because they are consisting of grains or because they're consisting of uh, finite objects with surfaces where the uh, Clearly, the order, the order uh, terminates. Hmm? Still, I mean, we would like to build a theory that is, uh, say, uh, nice to work with. So we're going to assume uh, uh, for a number of, uh, 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 for a number of um, further theories that uh, our lattices are composed of, infinite, of an infinite number of atoms. Hmm? So we want to describe geometrically now an infinite array of atoms ordered in some fashion. And the way we're going to do it is by introducing a very important uh, notion. And this is the notion of the Bravais lattice. Hmm? Note that I'm giving as a name, Bravais lattice. What is the Bravais lattice? The Bravais lattice is a geometrical concept. It's the set of all R's. Hmm? 
all vectors are that can be written in this form. N1, A1, plus N2, A2, plus N3, A3. Where N1, N2, and N3 are integers, positive and negative, of course. And A1, A2, and A3 are three independent vectors in three dimensions. OK? A1, A2, and A3 are independent vector. I assume that I'm working in three dimensions because that's the natural place where we do our theories, we build our theories. Independent means that they are not linear in de linear, linearly dependent one with respect to another, right? So I cannot write, say, A3 as a linear combination of A1 and A2, and A2 as a linear combination of A1 and A3. So there are three linear independent vectors in three dimensions. Okay? So this must be given. If I give you this, the Bravais lattice is identified by all points that satisfy this condition for all n1, n2, and n3 integers. Okay? All of them. All possible integers, n1, n2, and n3. These three vectors take the name of uh, primitive vectors. Now, of course, there is an obvious generalization to uh, different dimensions than three, obviously, right? If I work in two dimensions, then what I have to do is simply to consider two independent vectors instead of three, right? If I'm in one dimension, there's only one vector. If I'm in four dimensions, I have to introduce four independent uh, vectors and so on and so forth, and of course, four integers. But let's stick to three dimensions because this is where we really uh, want to uh, study our, I mean, systems, our real systems. In fact, uh, because the blackboard is, is flat, uh, uh, let me for a time being consider two dimensions, just because it's easier for me to, uh, to make drawings at the blackboard. So let me uh, immediately uh, show you an example now in two dimensions. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's, let's consider the, uh, this arrangement of, uh, of atoms, of points. In fact, I shouldn't call them atoms because this is now really a geometrical theory. I'm not saying that these are atoms. I'm just saying that these are vectors, right? So I'm talking about geometry here. I'm not really talking about. So they have points, points in space. And this array extends from plus to minus infinity. It covers the whole space, two-dimensional space here. Now, if, yes? It's a definition, yeah. It's a definition. So the definition is given three independent vectors, which I call primitive vectors, linear independent. A Bravais lattice is the set of all vectors, capital R, such that R is given by this expression for all possible values of uh, n1, n2, and n3 integers. Okay? It's a definition. This is what I define as a Bravais lattice. Okay? okay? I thought, um, why, um, why they call Bravais? Um, but, um, there because there are different... I, huh? Is there a meaning behind the word? Um, well, it's just an historical name. Bravais is a mathematician, and I mean, was a mathematician, is the first one to, to, was, who introduced this concept. Uh, the reason why we call it Bravais and not just lattice is because there are different kinds of lattice that we're going to introduce later on. Okay? So this is some sort of primitive uh, mathematical entity that we want to introduce to start our discussion. Mm -hmm. And we call it Bravais lattice, and that's the tradition. That's the way solid-state physicists uh, call this mathematical object. All right? So now I'm going to uh, visualize it now in two dimensions, unfortunately. So you have to now think of two independent vectors uh, in all possible integers and blah, blah, blah. But I, I hope uh, the discussion is uh, I mean, clear anyway. So this is my array of ordered points. Hmm? And if I say place the origin here, for example, then it is clear that if I consider A1 and A2 as these two vectors, uh, 
Hmm? I clearly generate uh, the whole lattice uh, using this definition. Hmm? So what I'm visualizing here as a clearly as an, as an ordered array of points uh, can be mathematically described by this definition, as long as I choose A1 and A2 as the two primitive lattices, as the two uh, primitive vectors, sorry, two primitive vectors. Okay, so once A1 and A2 are given, this definition corresponds to the set of points that I have in mind that I want to uh, describe here. For example, I mean, this point here would be characterized by N1 equals to 1 and N2 equals to 1, right? It's the, vec it's the point characterized by A1 plus A2, if I write it in this form. Now, we are forgetting about A3 because we are in two dimensions, right? Right, so this point here will be, well, let me write it. This is clearly A1 plus A2. So this corresponds to N1 equals to 1 and N2 equals to 2, obviously. What about this point here? N1 equals 1 and N2 equals 0. Okay, so this is 1, 0. What about this one? 2, 1, right? N1 equals to 2 and N2 equals to 1, and so on and so forth. If I go back here, this one, minus 1 and 1, obviously. Okay, I'm probably saying trivial things, but let's I mean, start this building our mathematical uh, tools before we move ahead to more complex uh, things. Okay, so I can uh, characterize every point uh, and I can assign uh, to every point in this uh, lattice, I can assign uh, two numbers, two integers, and these integers are uh, uh, the ones that allow me to describe that point using this definition with A1 and A2 uh, given. Now, let's uh, try to, uh, uh, I mean, understand a little bit better this definition. Suppose, suppose that now my system, instead of extending from minus infinity to plus infinity, was just limited to this piece of material. Okay, I have a piece of material made of uh, whatever, 16 points, very ordered, regularly arranged hmm, in these points. Is this a Bravais lattice? Can this be described as a Bravais lattice or not? Hmm? I'm asking you the question. Is this set of points, can this set of points be described by this definition? It's a mathematical statement. No. No, because here I'm saying for all n1, n2, and n3, right? So I cannot stop. If I, if I, whatever primitive choice of the primitive vectors I, I make, I need to include infinitely many points. I cannot stop myself somewhere. I have to consider infinitely many points. Okay? So a finite system is certainly not going to be described by a Bravais lattice. A finite system. It has to be infinitely big, obviously. We'll come back to that later on. Huh? Now we are discussing mathematics, okay? And that's the definition, and this is what uh, we are trying to describe, okay? So with this, if this is what we're trying to describe, and this is the definition, the answer is no. This definition does not apply to a finite system, clearly. All right. Second question. <clears throat> Suppose I now have an infinite system, so let me remove now the boundaries and assume that I'm extended... Uh, I'm extending really from minus infinity to plus infinity with my array of points. Mm -hmm. Is for a given array of points, is the choice of A1 and A2 unique? Certainly, if I give you A1 and A2, I uniquely identify what is the lattice, right? Because I just need to construct it. I give you A1 and A2, and I construct all the points that satisfy this condition, that generates a lattice by definition. But what about the opposite? Suppose I give you the lattice, for example, this one. Hmm? Is the choice of the primitive vectors unique or not? 
Mm? Some of you argue that it's not, of course, and it is, of course, uh, not true. In particular, for this one, take. Now I need to. Uh, take A1 and A2. Question, does this choice, the green choice of A1 and A2, generate the same lattice that, that was generated by the pink ones or not? Yes or no? Yes, it does. Right? For example, I can easily reach this point. Of course, in reaching this point, I have to do it by adding A1 and A2. So in my green notation, this is actually 1, 1. It's no longer 2, 1, right? And what about this one? How do I reach this point? Minus 1, 1, right? I first go along A2, and then I simply come back adding minus A1, right? Well, I'm not going to do it for all the points, of course, but. Uh, it's clear that with this green choice of uh, A1 and A2, I can generate exactly the same lattice. Do I generate more points than the pink choice? Is there an, any additional point that I'm generating with the green choice that I was not generating with the pink choice? No, right? For an obvious reason, because A2 is a linear combination of A1 plus A2. So as soon as I write this, integer times a1, integer times a2, I'm writing also integer times a1, integer times the pink ones. Okay, so I'm generating the same points I was generating using the old definition with the pink vectors. Yep. Uh, if you want to construct, uh, you, you, you are obliged to, to use the, the points or just to, to consider some, some properties, geometric properties? I'm discussing now points. For me, the, 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 the space is empty. Hmm? Is that your question? No, I want to know because when you want to, the R is uh, the resultant, uh, R is like uh, R. Yes, R. Okay, it's like the resultant of two vectors. Yeah, so R is the resultant of uh, the sum of two vectors, right. When, when you take R and A2, just if you, you consider the parallelogram, you can construct without. Uh, you want to consider this parallelogram, this one, for example? OK. So you can just consider this theorem for construct the resultant of the two vectors. You mean this one is the resultant of the two vectors, uh, of the a, a2 plus a1? Yes, this is what I used to write 1, 1. So what I'm saying is that this point can now be written as the sum of a2 and a1. Right? Sure. What was the question then? OK, well, OK, so the bottom line is the following. Uh, I have a lattice. Mm -hmm. The lattice can be, I mean, if it is a Bravais lattice, it must be described by this, uh, 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 by definition, by these uh, uh, conditions. However, for a, there, is, there are infinitely many choices of uh, the primitive vectors for a given Bravais lattice. Infinitely many, and you see it uh, by considering, for example, this one. What about A2 and again, A1 being always the same? So A1 remains the same, but now A2 becomes this one. Is this a good choice of the primitive vectors for the same lattice? Yes, it is, because I can generate any point, for example, this one, by going upwards with A2 and then coming back with A1. In other words, I mean, from a geometrical point of view, I can move in this direction using A1 as many times as I want, and I can climb one floor by using A2. It doesn't matter whether I end up here, here, my stairs end up uh, in a different place on this second floor, right? Because then I can move with A1. Mm -hmm. 
as much as I want. I mean, just need to add integers. So any A2 going from this point to any point uh, along this infinite line is OK as a choice of the primitive vectors. It's going to generate exactly the same, the same lattice. So in this particular case, at least, we have realized there are infinitely many choices of primitive vectors that generate the same Bravais lattice. All right? Yes? Oh, we're, you're talking about impurities now. So you want to know whether these properties uh, are retained when you introduce an impurity. Of course not. We're talking about a, an ideal system here. We're talking about the ideal system that not only does not contain impurities, but does not contain boundaries. It's infinitely extended. So it's clearly just a mathematical tool. No real system will ever be able, will ever be described by this, uh, exactly by this. But it's a very good approximation. So if you want to study defects, for example, in impurities, hmm, you first do your theory for an ideal system, and then you see the consequences of perturbing your ideal system by introducing an impurity. Okay, so that's the strategy that we have in mind. We first want to be able to describe the ideal system, and then we'll take care of uh, finite size uh, impurities and all that. In fact, we're not going to discuss impurities during this course, but if you wanted to study impurities in solid state physics, you would have to start from a theory of, uh, of the ideal crystal and then see how an impurity perturbs the ideal crystal. Right? So here, of course, there are no impurities. If I introduce an impurity, that is, if I remove one of the atoms, say I remove this one, I just remove it, and I leave all the other atoms there, this is, of course, not a Bravais lattice any longer. Okay? Because here I'm saying all integers. I'm not excluding anyone. If I remove this point, I would have to exclude the particular point with n1 equals to 2 and n2 uh, equals to 0, right? While here, I'm, I have to I'm forced to include all of them, okay? So an, an array of points where there is one missing atom, an impurity or a vacancy or something, is definitely not a Bravais lattice. The origin is what is important? Uh, um, that's a good point. Uh, no, of course, because every property is invariant under translational symmetry. I mean, if, uh, continuum translation. If I translate my whole solid by a finite amount, uh, I'm clearly not going to change the physics, right? Uh, so let me uh, decide to fix the origin at one of the Bravais points. Mm -hmm. In fact, I could choose to fix it here and then I will still be describing the system in this way, but of course, the origin of uh, where I place my primitive vectors will be here and not here. But of course, I'm this is trivial in some sense. I don't want to discuss this. Uh, I mean, the fact that I, I can place my primitive vectors here or here or here or here or here is somewhat, I mean, uh, trivial. I'm not going to discuss it, let's say. Although, of course, it's a possibility. It depends where you place your origin. Allow me only to place the origin at the position of a Bravais point or the Bravais lattice point, because that makes my life very sim much simpler. Otherwise, I would have to add a constant vector here, of course. OK. Now, examples of uh, Bravais lattices in two dimensions. Well, this one is the so-called square lattice. The square lattice is characterized by, notice, a Bravais lattice is uniquely identified by the uh, primitive vectors. If I give you the primitive vectors, that uniquely identifies uh, the Bravais lattice. Not vice versa, of course. If I give a Bravais lattice, there may be infinite choices of the, uh, of, uh, of the primitive vectors. But if I give you the primitive vectors, that uniquely identifies the, uh, the, uh, the Bravais lattice. Okay? So a square lattice is the lattice that is uniquely identified by two vectors, A1 and A2, such that A1 the length of A1 is equal to the length to, of A2, and of course, A1 and A2 are perpendicular. Okay, so this is what I define as square lattice, for example. Obviously, right? I think you're all fine with this, 
I don't need really to uh, explain too much about it. So I'm talking about examples of uh, Bravais lattices uh, in two dimensions now. What is another example of a lattice in two dimensions? An obvious extension of this one is the rectangular lattice. In this case, we have only that A1 is orthogonal to A2, period. The length of A1 and A2 can be anything. Okay, so what we have talked, so here we are talking about uh, this particular lattice, the square lattice, and here we are talking about something that could be, for example, like this. Okay, and here, for example, the two primitive vectors could be A1 and A2. Right? And their length uh, does not necessarily, uh, is not necessarily equal. While here it is equal, so this is called a square lattice, it is called a rectangular lattice. There's a very interesting example, another example of a two-dimensional uh, Bravais lattice in nature. It's actually a very uh, interesting for a number of reasons, and this is the so-called triangular lattice. It is interesting because it corresponds to the best way of packing circles in two dimensions. How do you pack circles in two dimensions? Well, if you... Uh, put some circles uh, here, you throw them on the floor, then of course the next ones will be sitting here, and the next ones will be sitting here. All right? So I'm trying now to pack spheres. Of course, I need to work with points. So what I mean by sphere, of course, identify... So these are the Bravais points, the Bravais lattice points. Now this is clearly neither a square lattice nor a rectangular lattice, obviously, right? If I can draw some lines here. Well, you, you see that they form uh, triangles, right? It's a very natural lattice in two dimensions, this one. In fact, one may even argue that this is even more natural than the square lattice in some sense, because spheres, circles, are very symmetrical objects. So you place a very symmetrical object, the most symmetrical objects you can think of, and you try to construct an array of, uh, of, uh, a very symmetrical, of very symmetrical objects, and the best way to pack them is by generating this triangular lattice. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, from a natural, somehow, I mean, definition, the triangular lattice is even more natural than the square lattice and, uh, and any other lattice in two dimensions. So how can I describe a triangular lattice? Oh, first of all, is it a lattice? Is it a Bravais lattice? Can I describe it as a Bravais lattice? Hmm? Is this a Bravais lattice? What I mean, of course, is the center of the circles. Are the center of the circles positioned in a Bravais lattice? Uh, can I describe them with this Bravais lattice mathematical tool? Well, I need to identify the primitive vectors. Hmm. Well, let me try with uh, these two vectors, for example. This and this. A1 and A2. Okay? Am I generating the whole lattice with those two vectors? Well, yes, right? If I arrange all my points in these lines, I can clearly move along this line using A1 as many times as I want, and I can climb floors by using A2, right? So I clearly fill the whole... So all the points in my triangular lattice can be described by multiples, integers of A1 and A2. Am I missing any point? No. So I'm covering. So all the points that correspond to the centers of these circles can be obtained as a linear combination with integers of A1 and A2. And vice versa, if I build any possible linear combination of A1 and A2 with integers, I generate one of the points of the 
of the triangular lattice. So a triangular lattice is uh, characterized by primitive vectors which are equal in length mm, and with an angle, let's say, uh, let me write it like that, A1, A2, the angle equals to 60 degrees. So the angle between A1 and A2 is 60 degrees, this one here. This angle is 60 degrees, obviously, right? It's a, an equilateral triangle that I'm building there. Notice that uh, after I give you this, hmm, you can forget about the way it has been constructed. You can be sure that if you have two vectors of equal length and they are at an angle of 60 degrees, one with respect to the other one, you construct a Bravais lattice starting from those two primitive vectors, you'll generate a triangular lattice, okay? Because this uniquely defines the lattice once the two vectors are given. So I need two vectors of equal length and with 60 degrees, one with respect to the other one. Then if I use those two vectors as the primitive vectors of my Bravais lattice in two dimensions, I generate a triangular lattice. Sometimes people like to call it hexagonal lattice, but it's, I mean, the simpler way to call it is the triangular lattice, actually. So let's, let's, I'll stick to this uh, name, triangular lattice. Is there any other choice of the primitive vectors? Obviously, yes. I mean, we've just proven that uh, there are infinitely many choices of the primitive vectors. I just wanted to show you another natural one, uh, and this is... Uh, a1 being the same, but A2 being this one. I like to mention this one because uh, contrary to the square lattice, where there was a single natural choice, which is the one I've been using here, and then there were infinitely many other choices that clearly looked less natural than the best one, than this one. Here, there are actually two equally natural choices, the blue one and the green one. Mm. The only difference is that here I am 60 degrees and here I have 120 degrees. Okay, so I could uh, equally say that uh, the two angles could be 120 degrees and I would still be generating a triangular lattice. And it's equally natural. Okay, I certainly cannot say that, uh, like in the square lattice, that there is one choice which is much more natural than the other ones and this is the the, what, this one, obviously, this one, the pink one. Clearly, the pink one is much more natural than the green one and the blue one. Here, I cannot say the same. Green and blue are the same as far as, I mean, so our symmetry uh, uh, ideas are concerned. Certainly, I can come up with more. I mean, I could choose A1 the same and A2 being, I don't know, this one, right? The vector going from here. Don't, 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 I mean, don't ask me to draw it because otherwise the plot is too messy. It would still be valid, but it would be less natural than the, the, the green and the blue one. Yes? No, the primitive vectors, no. With the only exception that there are systems for which uh, one choice is more natural than the other ones. Uh, so you better choose that. Uh, I mean, uh, because, I mean, or for example, when um, uh, when, 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 when the choice is not specified, it is typically the most natural one that you mean. Uh, in the case of the triangular lattice, in fact, there's a lot of ambiguity. If, even if you read a paper, I mean a research paper, uh, they don't tell you sometimes whether it's 60 degrees or 120 degrees, so you have to be careful. Okay? While in all other cases, it's, there is an obvious natural choice. Here, uh, it's really a matter of uh, I mean, taste. So uh, there's no uh, uh, convention. Uh, my experience, I mean, after, say, 25 years of research, is that you find 120 degrees 60% of the times and uh, 60 degrees 40% of the times. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but this is really just... Uh... Okay. Yeah? When you said the progress of the lattice, are the what? 
the same kind of uh, atoms. The atoms are decreasing of the mass. We're not talking about atoms yet. We're talking about points. Oh, just points. They're points. The, we're, we're not introducing, I mean, I'm using balls here, but just because I want you to keep in mind that sooner or later we will put atoms there. But so far, I've only introduced a mathematical geometrical uh, concepts. So I'm not discussing atoms yet. But I mean, it's always a good thing to keep in mind that sooner or later we will be replacing these points with atoms. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they, it's, can be different, they can be different. I'll come back to that in a in a in a in a, in a few minutes. Uh, yeah, in a few minutes, I guess. Yes. How can we define a How do we define? How do we define a lattice? I haven't defined a lattice. I've, so far, I've only defined a Bravais lattice. Also, you said the definition of I'll come back to that later on. I haven't defined a lattice yet. What I've defined a Bravais lattice. Trust me, we'll get there at some point. Okay, but I need to build the concepts one by one. So I've introduced this, which I call Bravais lattice, and this is the mathematical definition. Here are some examples. We've uh, made some statements about the unicity of the primitive vectors, about the uh, choice of the primitive vectors. That's it. I haven't defined yet what a lattice is, but we know what a Bravais lattice is. And I guess we know it in quite uh, some detail by now. give you another example of an ordered array of points, a nice one by the way. Hmm? I'm drawing lines here just to guide your eyes, but uh, of course, the only uh, geometrical cons I mean, uh, uh, entities that we've introduced are points. So I'm just introducing lines to uh, guide you the eyes to the, your eyes to this uh, structure. This is the so-called honeycomb lattice. OK? It's called honeycomb. Question, how can I write, how can I express these points, this infinite set of points, of course I'm assuming here that I'm extending this from minus to plus infinity, how can I express it using my definition? If, of course, this is possible. This may not be necessarily possible. All right. Well, we are in two dimensions, so we only need two vectors, right? Two primitive vectors. So let me start. Okay, let me put the origin here, for example. Mm -hmm. And according to what you're trying to say, I, okay, let me try with A1 here and A2 here. Right? The simplest choice. I probably have another choice to put it here, but let's start with this one. Fine. Am I generating all the points of this lattice using A1 and A2 and integers? Mm -hmm. What about this one? Well, actually, what about something simpler? Wait a sec. What about uh, this one here? It's slightly simpler. So I need to go from here up twice, right? And then come back once, right? Do we all agree? So this point is 1, 2 in our language. No? You don't agree with this? It is correct, right? I have to go up twice, and I will go here at the center, and then I come back here, and I get 1 and 2. What about this one? Well, this is more or less the same, right? I go twice, and then I come back. So this is going to be 2 and 1. Hmm? And I can do it. Uh, what about this? Well, if this was 1 and 2, I simply need to add another a1, and I get there. So this is 2, 2. 
But wait a second, where is 1, 1? Where is it? It's here. But there's no point there. Hmm? So it is not a Bravais lattice. Because once I give you the primitive vectors, all the points that can be obtained through integers must belong to the Bravais lattice. But wait a second. I might have missed something, right? I might have started with the wrong primitive vectors, uh, right? <laughs> I started with a given choice of primitive vectors and I've been unable to generate the Bravais lattice. But perhaps there is another choice. Uh, who knows? Hmm? Is there another choice of the primitive vectors that uh, allows me to construct this honeycomb lattice uh, and therefore showing that this is a Bravais lattice? If it is, of course. Well, I have all the other choices, say, with this vector here, and I can try. But I mean, this system has clearly a rotational symmetry, right? It's 120, you know, rotated by 120 degrees, nothing changes. Now, let's think a little bit, uh, yes, uh, Uh, what is the angle between these two vectors? This must be 120 degrees, obviously, right? No, no, it is 120 degrees. Yeah. Still, I mean, I have to find primitive vectors that uh, define that lattice. Can I find them? Okay, let me uh, remark something. This vector here hmm, must be, if this is a, let me uh, reason, I mean, uh, um, if this is a, 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 if this is a Bravais lattice vector, hmm, and it must be, if I want this to be a Bravais lattice, this must be a Bravais lattice vector, I take twice that vector. If the original vector was a Bravais lattice vector, I take twice that vector, that vector will also be made of integers, twice as big as the previous one. So any Bravais lattice vector that I take, I take twice that vector, that vector must be a Bravais lattice vector, right? Because if I was able to write the first vector in terms of integer times my primitive vectors, whatever the primitive vectors are, I take twi twice that vector, I simply need to take twice an integer which is three integers which are, or two integers which are twice the original integers, and I'm done. With integers, I can always find an integer which is twice the original integer. What I'm trying to say here is that uh, an important property of, the Bravais lattice, of a Bravais lattice is that if a Bravais lattice vector belongs to the lattice, obviously, then also any multiple of that vector must belong to the lattice. Now, if this vector belongs to the lattice, any multiple, including twice that vector, must belong to the lattice. And this is a general property. It doesn't depend on whether the lattice is square, rectangular, triangular, whatever. It's a general property of a Bravais lattice. It's an obvious quant qu a consequence of the definition, of the mathematical definition. So therefore, the honeycomb lattice is not a Bravais lattice. Right? We've been unable to find the primitive vectors, OK, but this is not a good proof. This is not enough. The proof is that uh, for a Bravais, for a, in a Bravais lattice, if a Bravais lattice, if a Bravais lattice vector is, belongs to the Bravais lattice, also twice that vector must belong to the, to the Bravais lattice, which is clearly not the case uh, for the honeycomb lattice. Because if this is a Bravais lattice uh, vector, twice that vector brings me to something, to a place where there's nothing. OK? So this is a mathematical proof that the honeycomb lattice cannot be a Bravais lattice. OK, so that partially answers uh, your, who was asking the question about uh, what, no, you were asking a question about uh, what is the lattice. OK? So here we have a lattice that is not a Bravais lattice. So we clearly need 
to extend this definition if we want to include uh, this lattice, certainly. Okay? This is not enough. This is not a good mathematical definition if we want to include, uh, if we want to do it, of course, if we want to include this. But this exists in nature, right? There are, I, I'm sure you've heard about graphene, right? This uh, two-dimensional object. Uh, uh, it's probably the only two-dimensional uh, material that we uh, it's never ever been synthesized in nature. So it's really the unique example of a two-dimensional system. And that two-dimensional system crystallizes in two dimensions into this uh, honeycomb lattice. It's made of carbon, right? It's one single sheet of uh, graphite. You exfoliate it and you get this uh, beautiful two-dimensional uh, system made of carbon atoms. And this is a honeycomb lattice. Unfortunately, this is not a Bravais lattice. So we need to uh, do something. We need to uh, play with our definitions in order to be able to include uh, also these lattices. Was there a question? No, you were? No? Sorry, I bet. So how do we include, uh, how, how do we extend the definition of a Bravais lattice in order to include also these lattices? We now, we're now going to extend it. So we're now going to uh, introduce the concept of crystal structure. It's another definition. Or, say it in a different way, lattice with a basis. <coughs> What is a crystal structure or a lattice with a basis? I mean, you can take uh, both. Uh, it's a definition, again, it's a mathematical definition. It's the set of all points R that can be obtained as n1, n1, a1 plus n2, a2 plus n3. A3 plus an, an arbitrary vector bi. And I can do it with a set of vectors bi's. I mean, b1, b2, b So, let me repeat it. In order to define a crystal structure or a lattice with a basis, I now need to introduce uh, more vectors. I need to introduce my primitive vectors. So I need to tell you what the primitive vectors are. And there are three in three dimensions, two in two dimensions. But in addition to that, I have to give you also another set of vectors, which is called the basis. So this is called the basis. It's a set of n, where n is finite, vectors that I need to provide you. Okay? So for, in order to define a crystal structure, lattice with the basis, I need to provide you with three, in three dimensions, independent vectors, plus I need to provide you with a set of n vectors, which I call the basis. After I've done this, we define the crystal structure, or the lattice with the basis, the set of all vectors which can be expressed in this form with n1, n2, and n3, all possible integers, and bi, any possible value of the basis vectors, any possible element of the basis vectors. Okay. Let me uh, give you an example before we, uh, we get lost. So now the definition requires more than uh, three vectors. It requires uh, three plus n vectors in order for me to be able to identify uniquely the, uh, the lattice with the basis or the crystal structure. Okay, so let me do it now again in two dimensions. <coughs> 
And let me start with the square lattice because it's simpler. Let me take a very simple example to start with. Okay, so I'm giving you uh, a one. I'm giving you a two. These are equal and orthogonal, so this is a square lattice. So I'm generating all the points uh, in uh, 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 infinite points that are identified by that. But then I also give you n vectors. Let me choose, let me fix n equals to 2 for simplicity. OK, but it can be more than that, of course. And it can be uh, something like this is b1. And uh, well, this is b2, for example. I made b1 and b2 smaller than a1 and a2, but there's no reason why they should be smaller than that. Anyway, just for, for the sake of uh, visualization, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing that b1 and b2 are smaller than a1 and a2 in, in length. Now, what do I mean by now the crystal structure constructed from a1 and a2 as primitive vectors and b1 and b2 as vectors in the basis? I mean all the points that can be generated in this form. That is, all points, I first have to identify all the Bravais lattice points generated by a1 and a2. And after that, I have to add either b1 or b2. So if I consider 0, 0, which is the origin here, the two points will be this and this. So these two points will belong to my crystal structure. Let me now take another Bravais lattice point, this one. I have to consider all the points that belong to the Bravais lattice plus B1 and B2 again. So I have to go here and here. Let me consider this point. This is also a Bravais lattice point. I have to add B1 and B2. And these are my two points. I'm using shades to identify those points and so on and so forth. Okay? So all these green points will be will belong to this crystal structure. Notice that unless one of the b's is the zero vector, unless it is a zero vector, the Bravais lattice points do not belong to the crystal structure, right? Because I need to add the bases here. I need to add all of them. And if none of them is zero, I will never touch a Bravais lattice point because I will have to first move to the Bravais lattice point and then add any of these vectors. But if these vectors are not uh, zero, I will have to move away from that point. Okay? So the green shadows here are the points that I'm generating according to my definition of A1 and A2 as the primitive vectors and B1 and B2 as the basis. I could, of course, have chosen more points in the basis, three, four, five. I would have generated more points around here, and of course, more points around here as well, more points around here as well, more points around there as well. So I'm extending the definition of a lattice to arrays which are a bit more complex than the ones I was describing with the Bravais lattice concept, right? Because the Bravais lattice only allowed me to uh, describe simple 
lattices. The honeycomb lattice, for example, was not included in this definition. I could not describe the honeycomb lattice using the Bravais lattice. I'll show you in a second that you actually can describe the honeycomb lattice using this definition. So, in short, the crystal structure, or the lattice with the basis, is a Bravais lattice to which I'm adding more points for each Bravais lattice point. So I have to first generate my Bravais lattice, and then around my Bravais lattice point, I place my points in the same way around every Bravais lattice point in my lattice. Okay? And but that gives me more freedom, because it allows me to, uh, to generate structures which are more complex than this one. By the way, it is clear that the Bravais lattice itself is a particular case of a crystal structure, right? I just need to choose uh, n equals to 1 and b1 equals to 0, right? So the Bravais lattice is a particular case of, uh, of a crystal structure. On the other hand, I need to introduce the Bravais lattice in order to introduce a crystal structure, because I need to know what uh, this is uh, before I can add uh, the uh, extra points around the Bravais lattice points. So the concept of a Bravais lattice uh, is very important in the definition of a crystal structure. Even though, as I just said, the points that I'm generating with the crystal structures may not actually lie in Bravais lattice points. Yes? Sorry? Yes, because uh, when I generate this, I can generate it in infinitely many ways, right? And I'm generating the same set of points, but just choosing two different, different choices of the primitive vectors. So that remains true. Okay? You have to think of crystal structure as a Bravais lattice with additional points around every point. How I generate the Bravais lattice, it's another story, and I can apply all my considerations uh, that I've already applied to the Bravais lattice, including the fact that uh, the choice is not unique of the... Uh, of the primitive vectors. Now, going back to the translation uh, question, obviously, I mean, in this case, uh, I may wish to uh, place the origin at one of the points. Instead of placing the origin here, I may wish to place the origin at, say, one of the points, for example. That might be more convenient in some cases. In that case, the only thing that changes if I change the origin is the definition of the basis vectors, right? Because if I place my origin here, for example, clearly b1 will be 0 and b2 will be uh, this vector here. Mm. It's just a matter of, uh, I mean, of, I mean, one has to be careful in the choice of, uh, of basis vectors uh, because there may be, uh, I mean, you, you might find it more convenient to place the origin at the position of a, of a point, rather than to place it somewhere else and having to displace every time to reach uh, your, your point from the Bravais lattice point. Okay? All right. Okay, so let me now go back to our honeycomb lattice and, uh, and see how we can describe it with uh, a lattice with the basis. Drawing line again just to guide your eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so where do we start? Well, we need to give uh, the primitive vectors now. Well, let me guide you now. So, a good choice of the primitive vectors is A1 and A2, for example. Now, this is going to give me all these points, right? Up, up, here. 
and this one, of course. But it's not going to give me these points, right? I, I, there's no way I can reach these small dots uh, by building linear combinations with integers of a1 and a2. But I can decide that this point is uh, b1 equals to 0, and this vector here is b2, right? So let me mark it with green here. Now, obviously, this point will be a1 plus b2. Same with this. Same with this. This one will be oh, a2 minus a1, and I get here, and then I add b2. Okay? Every one of these uh, small points uh, can be reached from this Ravellantis point uh, by adding b2. Okay, so I'm now showing with uh, green these points. All of them can be reached uh, from, b, from, uh, from the Bravella at this point uh, by adding b2. So in this particular case, uh, I have the Bravella lattice is the triangular lattice generated by a1 and a2. Mm -hmm. And the basis is composed of two vectors. b1 is just 0. I just stay there. And b2 is this vector here. Okay? So if I give you these two primitive vectors and these two elements in the basis, you can tell me, well, this is the honeycomb lattice. I've been able to generate the honeycomb lattice. But I needed, unfortunately, I needed to introduce uh, a basis. I, I was unable to describe the honeycomb lattice using a bare Bravais lattice. I need the Bravais lattice plus I need extra points inside for every Bravais lattice point in order to be able to introduce. Uh, now, now that we, uh, let's try and think at now filling these uh, points uh, with atoms, right? Uh, we have to remember that eventually we will uh, consider this not just as a mathematical tool, a geometrical tool, but as a, a way to describe the position of the atoms in our crystal. And obviously, if you have a, a solid, the solid is not necessarily composed of uh, atoms of the same kind. That may be carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, aluminum. I mean, it can be a complex material. Mm? And there are crystals which are composed of complex uh, arrangements of elements, of different elements. Mm? Now, obviously, if you're dealing with a system, with a material, with a solid, with a crystal, which is composed of different elements, there is no way you can describe it using a Bravais lattice, because all the points would be equivalent, while you know that, uh, I mean, different points might correspond to different atoms. So you don't want to describe them as the same point. Mm -hmm. So the concept of a crystal structure or a lattice with a basis is particularly natural whenever you are dealing with uh, materials uh, which are not just uh, made of a single element. If you have more than one element, uh, you clearly need to distinguish uh, atom white and atom green, right? So you need to have a basis of at least two vectors if you have two uh, elements. If you have three elements, at least three vectors, right? If not more. Now, typical crystal structures, uh, natural ones, uh, they are described by, of course, a Bravais lattice, plus a basis, which is typically made of uh, one, two, well, if it's one, it is a Bravais lattice, but two, three, I mean, up to uh, hundreds or uh, thousands of atoms, okay, in the basis. So there's no limit in principle. Um, the only limit is our ability to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to measure it, to detect it, I mean, that crystal structure. In fact, uh, even though, I mean, the, in, in material science, in solid state physics, uh, crystal structures that we work with are typically made of at most uh, 20, 30, 40 atoms, 40 elements in the basis, uh, 
uh, there are fields in which the number of uh, vectors in the basis can be uh, hundred thousands. This is the field of uh, biochemistry. Mm? Um, a very probably the only way in which you can uh, uh, determine the structure of complex molecules like proteins, for example, mm, is by crystallizing them. So you take proteins, all of the same kind, and then in some way you crystallize them. So you pack them together in such a way that they form an ordered array of uh, complex molecules. And they are all the same. They just repeat themselves in, a, in an ordered way. Mm. Now, these are very complex crystals because the Bravais lattice can be anything. It can be uh, I mean, any, I mean, any Bravais lattice. But the number of points in the basis is huge because it's the number of atoms in your protein. Because each protein itself is repeating regularly. And each protein can have 100,000, a million, a million uh, atoms in the, in the structure. Right? So there are cases in which the Bravais lattice is uh, something and the basis is made of a million atoms, of a million points. It's huge. Okay? So you have a, out of every Bravais lattice point, you have a million points around it which correspond to the positions of the molecule. You have a complex molecule, uh, well, I shouldn't use the honeycomb lattice, let me use the square one. So around each point there is a, a very complex molecule. And that very complex molecule repeats itself regularly like this. But each one of these uh, molecules uh, can have up to uh, in ten hundreds or million uh, uh, um, atoms. Okay? So the number of basis vectors, uh, that is all the vectors that uh, connect all the points uh, in the mole all the atoms in the molecule, can be uh, huge. Mm -hmm. This is not fortunately our problem, it's the problem of those who do biochemistry, who crystallize these macromolecules. In, our, in solid state physics, you tend to work with a small number of uh, points in, uh, within every Bravais lattice point. But I just wanted to uh, uh, give you a flavor of uh, what people do in uh, fields that are not necessarily solid state physics. And we'll come back to that when we discuss X-ray diffraction in a few, uh, in, a, in a couple of lectures. All right. Let me spend the remaining 10 minutes uh, discussing, I mean, going to three dimensions. We've been discussing so far only two-dimensional uh, lattices. Let me start moving to three dimensions. And let me start uh, with, uh, let me start with uh, Bravais lattices first. Okay, so I'm now going to give you a few trivial examples of Bravais lattices in three dimensions. So the simplest one is the cubic lattice. Mm -hmm. The cubic lattice is defined by three generating vectors. And of course, I have to continue like this. But if I define the three vectors, a1, a2, in A3, I'm clearly generating a cubic uh, uh, arrangement of atoms, right? So I'm generating all the points. Uh, yes, come in. And so on and so forth, right? Yes? Do we have other cloud like a cloud lattice and crystal structure? Do we have anything more than that? Uh, mm, well, <laughs> then you start moving into the field of quasi-crystals, for example, which is a completely different and very complex uh, topic. But as far as, uh, say, standard solid-state physics is concerned, from mat the mathematical description of uh, crystals uh, ends with these two definitions. Okay? Are they good to really those with the exception of quasi-crystals, uh, this is okay for uh, everything, okay? As long as it is periodic, of course. There is translational periodicity, 
Of course, you're not going to be able to describe uh, glasses or amorphous systems with these uh, mathematical tools. So that's a completely different story. So if, if, if the object have some kind of symmetry, then... If, if, it is, if there is translational order, okay. right, then it can be described with uh, these two. Or, in fact, only with this one, since we've realized that the Brave lattice is, in a, is, in a, is a particular case of a, of, a, of a crystal structure. All right, so the Brave lattice, uh, so this is an ex a very simple example, probably the simplest example. It's called the cubic lattice. Right here, A1 is equal to A2. Oh, now I have to introduce A3, of course, right? Because we are in three dimensions. And the three of them are perpendicular. Um, well, AI, so IJ is equal to uh, uh, zero if I is different from J. Okay? Equal length and perpendicular to one another. There are then other uh, types of uh, lattices, like uh, you can have a lattice in which uh, the base is still square, so A1 and A2 form a square lattice, but the third dimension is arbitrary, perpendicular but arbitrary. Okay. So here I have uh, A1 equals to A2, and then AJ, A, A, I is color, uh, AJ equals to zero. Okay? Not A3 can be anything of any length. Orthogonal to A1 and A2, but of any length. Okay? So this is called tetragonal lattice. These are examples of Blavet lattices in three dimensions. Okay? If I relax even this condition, but I keep the three vectors orthogonal, well, don't ask me to draw it now. If I just keep uh, this condition, right, without saying anything about the length of A1 and A2 uh, and A3, then this is called orthorhombic. Cubic, tetragonal, orthorhombic. Let me now start relaxing the condition that uh, the, the uh, primitive vectors need to be orthogonal. Let me consider a very interesting system, which is a uh, very interesting lattice, which is the one in which you have a, a triangular lattice in two dimensions, and then you add a third dimension vertically. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, A1 and A... Oops, uh, sorry. You have uh, A1 and A2. Now I'm using a projection now, right? I'm projecting it. In. And then A3, vertical. And this A1 and A2, they generate a triangular lattice, okay? In two dimensions. Okay, so A1 and A2 are a triangular lattice which means uh, A2 and A1 have the same length, and the angle is 60 degrees or 120 degrees. And then I have a third vector, which is orthogonal to both. So A3 scalar A1 or A2 is 0. Hmm? This is called, uh, this is called uh, the hexagonal lattice. In fact, that's the reason why people, some people call hexagonal a triangular one. I prefer to keep the uh, correct definition, which is triangular for the two-dimensional one, and hexagonal as soon as you add the third direction, a third dimension. 
And then, I mean, uh, for, uh, this monoclinic, uh, blah, 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 triclinic, uh, when there is no uh, relationship between A1, A2, and A3, they're just arbitrary vectors, uh, you call them triclinic. There are a couple of other examples, but I really don't want to go into the details of that. Uh, triclinic lattice, uh, where no uh, constraint. There's no constraint on uh, A1, A2, A3. It can be anything. And there are two more cases, like the monoclinic. Uh, and the, and the uh, rhombohedral, but uh, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of uh, it's a zoology. Of, it's not really relevant. Although, of course, if you uh, do research and you open a paper and they will tell you, ah, this crystal is uh, uh, tetragonal and they give you uh, two numbers. Hmm? In principle, if I want to identify a Bravais lattice, I need three vectors, right? So I need uh, nine numbers. So why do they give me just two numbers? Well, they give me two numbers because for a tetragonal lattice, the only thing I need to know is the length of A1 and the length of A3, right? I don't need to know anything else. If I tell you it's tetragonal, as long as we agree that the first number is the length of the base and the third number is the length of the third uh, direction, I'm done. I just need to give you two numbers. Square lattice, sorry, cubic lattice, I only need to give you one number the length of this vector. I don't need to give you the three, uh, uh, nine, nine numbers which identify the three vectors. Co on the contrary, for uh, say, well, no, for the hexagonal lattice, I also need to give you only two numbers, the length of this and the, the height of A3. And of course, I need to tell you it's hexagonal, so then you will know that you have to construct your uh, uh, primitive vectors 60 degrees or 120 degrees. Triclinic lattice, uh, well, you have to give me everything. In fact, you don't really need to give me nine numbers if you think about it, right? Because uh, I can rotate my three vectors arbitrarily in space, mm -hmm. and I will obtain the same system. So what defines uh, the three vectors is not really their arbitrary position in space, but it's only their length, okay, three numbers, and the three vectors formed by the three pairs of uh, primitive vectors. Okay, so it's a total of six numbers, three lengths and three angles. Once you have given me this, I can orient it the way I want and I will generate exactly the same lattice, of course, with a different orientation in space, but who cares about that, right? So that's important. If you uh, take a, a, I mean a, a open a paper and you'll find that uh, you, uh, the, the structure that you, they're dealing with is a triclinic structure, they will give you the three lengths, A, B, and C, typically, and the three vectors between the three angles, between the three, uh, the three pairs of uh, primitive vectors. Okay, so six numbers are enough to define the most general lattice, Bravais lattice, in three dimensions. Okay. Um, Yes, this is a good point where to stop. Is there any question at this point? No? Okay, so I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>